welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this program today, which I'm sure you're going to find very interesting. Before we get into that, I'd like to uh, remind you that if you have any questions or comments, even suggestions for programs you'd like to see, uh, please let us hear from you. Send your emails to sundaynightprime at ewtn.com. I repeat that. Sunday night prime at EWTN.com. Our program tonight is entitled A Police Officer's Journey in Faith. You know, when Jesus called his first disciples and those who were going to follow him, he called them from all kinds of backgrounds. He called the fishermen, he called the tax collector, he called St. Paul as a Pharisee and zealot for the faith and even one of his own apostles, uh, you know, Simon the Zealot, uh, you know, he, he seemed to uh, have been maybe a part of a, uh, a either political party or group uh, that was uh, maybe had more military kind of interests. So God calls us from every background, you know. You know, uh, it, it's the Lord who calls. Huh? As Jesus reminded the apostles, not you who chose me, it's I who chose you. Well, you know, sometimes even from our police, our police officers, you know, they hear the gospel too. And tonight we've got a wonderful story. He's a good friend of mine. I'd like to introduce uh, to you my good friend, uh, John Marino. John, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Father. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. You know, I work with John in various uh, uh, situations of preaching. He'll tell you all about that because we're going to go through a police officer's journey of faith. John, I know you well, but the people don't. So why don't you share a little of your background, maybe, you know, your early your background and uh, growing up in New York? Well, going way back uh, as a youngster, I lived in St. Paul the Apostle Parish. <clears throat> in those days, if you asked the Catholic where they lived, they would give you the name of the parish. That's right. So I, <clears throat> I lived in Sacred Heart. I, I lived in St. Paul the Apostle, and my wife-to-be lived in Sacred Heart. The two parishes were maybe 20 blocks apart. On, on, uh, in Manhattan. Um, and St. Paul the Apostle had a very fine grammar school. I went to St. Paul's and I met a Sister Modesta. And Sister Modesta taught me the Baltimore Catechism. Now, in Sister's class, you could miss a math question. That wouldn't be too bad. Uh, you could miss maybe how your grammar, you, what you did in grammar. But you better know who made you and why he did. <laughs> Graduated the eighth grade there. I know my faith better than a lot of adults do in, this, in today's day and age. Yeah. It was a marvelous, marvelous induct, in, introduction into my faith. The problem was, when I left there, I went to a public high school. By the time the four years were over in the public high school, I had stopped the practice of my faith. I stopped going to Mass. Now, at first, you feel terrible about it. You know, you feel mm -hmm. guilty. I remember Sister Modesta, uh, mortal sin and the punishment. And, and, but, you know, repetition and time weakens the, con the conscience. Uh, many years later... The petition in doing the wrong things. Is that, yeah. mm -hmm. Many years later, I was able to get my car and drive my wife and family to church, and I would sit in the car and read the paper while they went to Mass. And it didn't bother me a bit. And I think of now what a horrible example I was giving to my children. And that's what I did for many, many years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Till the Lord caught up with you, huh? Yeah. In a very yeah. strange way. Yeah. I was a, years later, now I'm a sergeant in the 24th precinct. I'd just been promoted, and I get to a new command, 24th precinct. I find out that the captain is promoting a retreat for police officers, and he let it be known that any of the members of his command that went on this retreat, life would be much better at the command after that. <laughs> <coughs> so I went on that retreat to please my captain. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> you can't refuse. <laughs> I went on that retreat to, to, to please my captain. Now I go into the retreat, and the beginning of it was fine. I met a lot of very high-ranking uh, supervisors there. As a matter of fact, the police commissioner, Michael Codd, was there. He was a very active in the retreat movement. And it was a nice experience until all of a sudden one of the priests said, uh, now, gentlemen, we're going to hear confessions. I said, oh, boy, I didn't sign on for this. The captain will never know if I don't go. And no way am I going into that room and telling the priest that I haven't been to church in 20 years. <laughs> but then the priest said, well, you know, uh, if you want, if you don't want to, if you're not ready for confession, if you want to have a, just a conference with one of the priests, just pick one, whoever, whichever one you want, and you can sit with him in his office for a while. So I thought, well, I can go for that. I can go private conference. <laughs> 
So I met with Father Kennan in his room, and we started some idle conversation, some idle talk, and all of a sudden, Father says to me, John, would you like me to hear your confession now? And suddenly I'm giving a good account of those 20 years as I possibly could. All of a sudden I'm saying an act of contrition, like I've been saying so many years ago, it just poured out of me perfectly. And then I hear Father announcing the words of absolution. And I got up and he's congratulating me. I, I walked out and I went to my room and I, I sat down in my room and I started thinking, what happened? <laughs> could God's love be so tremendous? That 20 years of sinful doubt and neglect could be forgiven in those few minutes. I had a lot of trouble, to, <laughs> had a lot of trouble absorbing that. Um, and it got me involved in the retreat movement. It got me involved uh, in that retreat house as a volunteer. I figured I had, I had something to pay back, to pay back to God for his forgiveness and for those priests at the retreat house for making it possible. Yeah. So I became a volunteer, became president of the league, and um, eventually I, I, I joined what they called the Speakers Bureau. I would go out each Sunday and we would go to a different parish and promote the retreats. I did that for a while. Then Father Mike Brennan, who was the retreat director, uh, allowed me to give one of the retreat talks. I would mm. come in on a Sunday afternoon and I would give one of the presentations. I was doing that for a while. And then one day he comes to me and he says, John, look, he says, if you would retire from the police department, if you retire from the police department, I have a position for you here on the staff. I go, wow. <laughs> he said, but you know, he said, we got to get some credentials. We got to get you a little background. Mm -hmm. So we decide that I'm going to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I went to St. John's. I managed to stay at St. John's, and I, I had my undergraduate degree in theology. I step go, kept going. I got a master's in Catholic doctrine. And then Father Mike says to me, John, you, you know, you got your education now. Uh, uh, retire. You're going to retire? And I panicked. I go, whoa, wait a minute. Lieutenant's a nice job. I was a lieutenant in the police department at the time. <laughs> That's a nice position. And I've got three daughters that want to, that I have marriages to look forward to. I have a mortgage on my house, and I'm quitting my job. Well, wait a minute. <clears throat> so I'm starting to panic, and I think what I need is a retreat. But I don't want to go with the pas with the passionists. That's the retreat house that the, the, the retreat house had. I went to to Gloucester. The Jesuits have a beautiful retreat house in, in Gloucester. And I went on a five-day all-silent retreat. And I was sitting out on the locks there, beautiful, the ocean rolling in, and I'm reading the scriptures a little bit. And I read that passage that said, he who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking over his shoulder is not worthy of the kingdom. I said, wow, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I went home. I told my wife, I'm retiring. <laughs> the next day I went to headquarters, turned in my shield, and I went back on the subway, and I wasn't a cop anymore. How did it hit you? It hit you hard? That was, uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's a that's horrible, horrible feeling. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I was never sorry. I was never mm -hmm. sorry. I had a marvelous 13 years in that retreat. I was working there. Um, I met some marvelous people, worked with some great priests. Uh, it was a really tremendous experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but that making that decision to do it, that, <laughs> that was the one that, that was tough. <clears throat> you, you, let, you left everything, in a sense, uh, John, to follow Christ. Uh, you know, you took that step in faith. I remember you had shared with me before the program, <laughs> people would be interested why you had uh, decided to become a, a police officer in the first place. <laughs> How did you just share that little story? I, know. I never wanted to be a cop. It was, not, it was way down on the bottom of my list. But my father was a product of the Depression. He struggled through the Depression with a little restaurant that he had. And he knew that during the Depression, the only ones that had decent jobs were civil service. So he kept telling me, civil service, civil service. Well, I wouldn't take the fire department because I'm afraid of ladders. I can't go up on the third <laughs> rung of a ladder. So I, I, I took the police test. And the first test, uh, I, I didn't even pass. I failed the first test. And then they had another one right away because they didn't have enough people passing it. And I got on the police department. And I had a marvelous career. I had 30 years in the police department. Mm -hmm. I retired at the rank of lieutenant. Uh, and now I have the police pension, you know, which is, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. So is it, maybe I should have listened to my father more often because he was giving good <laughs> advice. <laughs> right, very good, very good. Well, you certainly had a full career in, in uh, serving as a police officer and, uh, you know, many experiences that I'm sure, uh, you know, become anything we go through. 
God can use, you know, like St. Paul said, for those who love God, all things work together for good. You know, St. Augustine added even our sins. So even your, like your conversion that you mentioned, your confession, how God, he really set you up, didn't he? When he <laughs> said, go in and have a little talk and all of, a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden. And you know, uh, John, maybe we could talk about that just for a moment, uh, you know, um, in terms of, uh, your experience in, in confession, and I know so many, many people who uh, experienced uh, God's grace to set them free, huh? to uh, really allow them to begin to follow Christ, because sometimes people are enslaved by sin, or fears, shame, like you said, you know, I gotta, uh, these things keep us bound up until you know, God, uh, God's grace, through God's grace, we are le able to let it go and to hear those words you said, you know, when the priest, I know as a priest, you know, when I say, and I absolve you from your sins, uh, you know, the, the church doesn't use the word forgive you, you know, she could have used that word forgive, but use the word absolve because absolve, uh, most people don't realize it. it comes from two Latin words, ab, A-B, which means from, and solvere is a verb that means to untie you. And that's what sins are. It's like a heavy burden you're carrying around. And when you go to confession, the burden is untied and you're set free. You know, as I reflect back on that, Father, I realized that had I not gone to the confession, that retreat wouldn't have changed my life at all. It would have been a nice time with the boys, Gavin, with the, with mm -hmm. the, with the, with the other cops in, in, instead of the station house, it would have been in the retreat house, and it would have meant absolutely nothing. It was that sacrament of confession that made that retreat for me, turning my life around. And as I sat in that room pondering what was happening, I, I made a promise. I was moved to make a promise that I would never again become a non-practicing Catholic. That no matter how my faith wavered or no matter how many doubts I may have incurred along the way, that I would never again become a non-practicing Catholic. And that promise has stood in good stead for a number, number of times, yeah. when every once in a while I would think of maybe going back to my old ways a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that confession was a very powerful, powerful uh, moment in my life, turned mm -hmm. my whole life around. I hope a lot of our <laughs> listeners who may not have been to confession for a while will take courage from your words, uh, John. You're, you're, uh, you're getting the message out here. And maybe there's some people out there listening right now. God is talking to their hearts. This is the time to come back. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. It may, it may seem difficult, you know, to go into that room and, and uh, say, well, how am I going to tell the priest everything I did? You know, uh, priest, uh, we don't dwell on these things. You know, I hear confessions, and afterwards I just kind of, just let it go. It's, it, it, what's important, you know what's important, I'll be honest with you, is the joy that Jesus said there's more joy in heaven over one <clears throat> sinner who repents than over 99 just people who don't need that repentance. That I think of. Boy, there's a person now set free. I hope they'll persevere like you're saying. You know, you, you, you made that decision. I'm not going to go back on this now. So I hope if there's uh, any part of the program so far that's uh, touching people, this would be the most important is, you know, if you're in need of a good confession, and then go regularly confession. Pope uh, John Paul used to encourage what we call the devotional confession, uh, which is one where a person does not have mortal sin, serious sin, separating them from God, but they want to keep closer to him. You want to get closer and closer. So even the little things, let's get rid of them too. Well, I make it a practice now. I go once a month. That's I go great. once a okay. month. Okay. That's good. And at my last talk on that retreat, when I was on the retreat team, my last talk, I used to beg the retreat. And look, the retreat is almost over. If you haven't gone to confession yet, please don't leave this without going to confession. If you want to go, I'll get arranged. I'll arrange you. I'll get one of the priests and I'll arrange it. But don't leave here without going to confession. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I would get one who was trying to sneak out, and I would get a call. <laughs> Very good, John. That's, uh, I think, you see, you, you spe you're speaking from your heart because, uh, you, you know, you, you've been there. And I oh, know, yes. <laughs> I know how the fears are. I know the faults, uh, sense that, you know, I'm, I'm just, it's just too much for me to do. Oh, no, no. No, I, you know what God has in store for you. And, uh, and so that's why, you know, we, we certainly encourage uh, 
all of our listeners to make sure that they use confession. You know, once a month is what Our Lady of Fatima had asked for. So you're right on, you know, and, and uh, you know, for the first Saturday devotion, now you can go any day during the month as long as you have the intention of offering your confession as part of the first Saturday devotion. So that's uh, very good. John, we're going to have to take a break now, but don't leave us. We're going to be right back. Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for tonight's program, and our special guest is a good friend of mine, John Marino. Our title of our uh, program tonight is Police Officer, A Police Officer's Journey of Faith. And uh, John, you told us uh, the first big step in that faith, you know, with your uh, confession there on that retreat. Um, what happened? How did, the, how did that affect you when going back to your police work? Uh, how was it changing your own personal life? You, you know, I had to become. There's a big challenge in police work. Uh, if you want to be a person of faith, and if you want to be a good, police effective officer. cop, a good yeah. tough cop, you got to be kind of a tough cop. Yeah. Uh, and there's a challenge there. It's like calling for two different uh, attitudes, two different personalities. Uh, and I had to kind of balance that, uh, become a different kind of a person. A story comes to mind. Um, I was working as a sergeant uh, in Harlem, up in Harlem, and I've been in a station house on meal with my driver. We finished the, the um, uh, finished our dinner, uh, our lunch. We went. We were going back to the radio car. I'm approaching the radio car, and I hear a voice say, "Hey, Sarge," and I turn around, and there's a large black man standing there, and he says, "I need help." I said, "Well, go in the station house. They'll help you there," and he says, "Well, I've been in there. And they tell me they can't help me." So I said, well, look, if they can't help you in the station house, I sure can't help you out here. And I started walking to the car again. And he said, but I'm hungry. So now I turn around and I say, okay, pal, lay it on me. What happened? He says, I just got out of the joint. He says, I did some heavy time. He says, um, and I, 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 I can't get a job. I can't find any work. And I haven't eaten in two days. He says, well, what did you do to get such heavy time? He says, I was burglarizing an apartment, uh, and I, the man came home. I just wanted to get away. He says, I just tied him up to get away, but he died. So now the response of a normal, <laughs> regular police officer would be, you're a murderer. <laughs> you're a murderer. You want me to help you? You're a murderer. Uh, too bad. You know, you didn't suffer enough. How about that poor old man dead on the floor? How about his yeah. family? Yeah. How about all the pain you caused? Instead, I hear myself saying, I can go with turkey sandwich and a coffee. How does that sound? And he says, boy, that would be great. So I put him in the back of the radio car, and I tell my driver to go to the delicatessen that we normally use. I said, go and get a turkey sandwich and a coffee. My driver's looking at me, and he's shaking his head. <laughs> so he gets the sandwich. We go and we park on the side street somewhere. We're a little out of the way. And I listen to him talk as he's gulping down the sandwich. And he's telling me about what it's like doing hard time, what it's like in prison, and what it's like to come out and realize you can't even make enough money to feed yourself. So after he was finished, I said to him, all right, look, I, what do you want to do now? I don't know what you, he said, well, if I can get up to the Bronx, if I get on the subway, I might be able to get up to the Bronx. There's some people up there that might help me. I said, okay, that's great. So we go to the entrance of the subway. And I decided to go down on the platform with them. I had to get them to a turnstile. So you wouldn't mm. have to, you know, I go down on the, on the platform with them, waiting for the train. And as the train is coming in, I said to him, have you ever tried God? And he said, I tried that prayer stuff. It doesn't work. So the doors are opening. He's leaving me. I said, look, for what it's worth, it was Jesus Christ that bought you that sandwich. He gets in the train. The doors close. If I saw him now, I wouldn't recognize him. But now I'm leaving. I'm thinking about Jesus Christ bought you the sandwich. Where did that come from? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> I, if I wanted to say something about my faith, couldn't have been something more intelligent than that. What was that? But as I you know, got through my theology and I learned an awful lot, I realized that it's true. 
uh, if I'm buying that sandwich because of my faith, because of my love of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is buying the sandwich. So it's a different kind of cop. It's a different kind of approach. You still have to do your job. You still have to make yeah. arrests. You still have to at time hurt people. Yeah. But you want to do it in a way where those opportunities where maybe you can say something about your faith, when you can move somebody in the right direction, that you do it. Yeah. Yeah, where, where are you are allowed to do that? Sure, John. That was a great thing. That's a, that's a wonderful example. I'm, I'm sure that man must have thought about that, your kindness to him, you listened to him. You, you know, you, sometimes just listening to people makes them feel, feel great because maybe they're in a position like that fellow, poor fellow was, uh, that nobody would listen to him. I mean, he did do wrong. We're not, we're not exonerating that, but, uh, you know, he, he, he did pay his time in prison, and, uh, but Jesus forgives, you know, he's on the cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. He forgive a thief there who was dying. So a different approach. You're right. You, you have to, you know, I think it's important for the people to realize, you know, as a, a police officer, you have uh, certain, uh, you know, re re responsibilities and justice to the people. As a police officer, you have to protect them. You have to protect the innocent. You have to restrain those that are doing wrong. You, you have to do that, you know, but you Christ was working in you, John. I don't even know if you realized what was, like you said, where did this come from? At the time, I didn't. But in time, I began to reflect back on these things that happened in my life. And I realized that God was so active. The Holy Spirit was guiding me so many different ways, so many different decisions, so many different things that I did. Uh, and it's exciting when you start to realize that, that God is working in your life like that. Uh -huh. And you want to continue. You want to do more. That's right. That's a transformation, isn't it? Huh? How beautiful. Yeah. How beautiful, John. You would have just been the police officer, John Marino, you know, sergeant, and uh, just I did my job and that was it. But Christ was working through you. See, you can't, you're one person, but you're being changed on the inside and how you approach the same thing you, you had always been doing as a police officer. But there was something added. I, I guess it's that internal transformation that Christ wants, as you know. Uh, we, we just celebrated the Feast of St. John the, the Baptist and remember his response as his mission was coming to an end. Jesus was, you know, he's pointing out Jesus at the, you know, the Jordan there is the Lamb of God. And when his own disciples came to him and they said, well, you know, everybody's following that man you, you called the Lamb of God, you know, and they're not following you any longer. And he said, well, I'm not the Messiah. I told you that. He said, Jesus, he must increase. I must decrease, and, and that's what happens, you know. I think that's what was, the, the Spirit of God was working in you, John, and, and look at how far he brought you, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you ever think you were, <laughs> as you were a sergeant in Harlem? That's a I'll, tough assignment, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll tell you a, a remark. My, when I got so involved, a remark my wife made, she said, you know, I prayed real hard for you to go back to the faith, but I didn't think you were going to take it over when you got there. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, your wife, Pat, she's just wonderful, you know, yeah, and I know she's been so su oh, supportive yeah. in helping she you in your, your uh, no, wonderful no, ministry. Another, well, let's get back to your... Another blessing of my life. Huh? Another blessing of my life. Right, my right. Yeah, well, uh, Sister Modesta helped you yes. have that... I pray for her often. I pray for her often. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, we should be very grateful, shouldn't you know, we? A quick story on Sister Modesta, yeah. if I might. I'm, in a I'm on a retreat staff now, and we, we had a retreat for nuns, a re retreat for sisters. So the retreat director calls me, and by this time it's Father Paul. Father Paul calls me to his office. He says, look, we're hearing confessions for the sisters. He says, we both have to hear confessions. He says, you give the talk introducing them, preparing them for confession. I said, you want me to give a talk to 50 nuns prepare them for confession? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> so I said, well, I got to do it. I gotta, so I, I got to talk together. It went over well, the nuns like uh -huh. that. But I'm, as I'm up there speaking, I said, boy, Sister Modesta should see me now. <laughs> <laughs> she would be uh, She would amazed. be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did a good job. Yeah, she, she, you yeah. you know, it's, a, it's another important point, isn't it? John, you know that uh, your conversion uh, came about, I mean, it was the grace of God. It was the moment, like St. Like Paul said, you know, God who, you know, he chose the time when he was going to reveal his son to me. Well, he, re he <laughs> revealed him again. You're a revert, you know, you were part of the faith, you left it, you came back, yeah, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, when God was ready to revert you back to the faith, 
huh? he showed his son to you in that sacrament, but you had that strong foundation. You know, and, and how, isn't that important for parents to remember, give your children when they're little a solid you know, understanding of the faith according to their ability, of course. You know, but do take time to tell them about the faith, about Jesus, about Our Lady and the sacraments. If it wasn't for that background, I don't think that the whole scenario would have worked for me. I would have no faith to go back to. I wouldn't know what I was talking about. Uh, that was the, the bulwark of, of my whole experience. That, that initial training. That's why I get so upset when I hear people tell, well, I don't want to teach my child any faith. I'll wait until they grow up and they can pick their own. Oh, that's a horrible decision. That's know? right. That's a horrible decision. Yeah, because there's nothing there to guide them, you know, and especially today, you know, with so many different philosophies and things that children are exposed to that, you know, even my, we think back to your time, my time, you know, it, it just these things were not being taught. You know, uh, the sex education programs that are exposing children to this thing that are bizarre, you know, from when they're very, very young. How are they going to know the difference between right and wrong unless somebody explains that and that, that faith? So, but uh, that was certainly very important. But let's, let's keep going on on your, your, your journey here, uh, John. It's, it's very interesting. So you, you uh, had left, you had retired from the police force, and then uh, you went to work there at the retreat house in uh, Jamaica, that's right, in Jersey, yes, Queens. Jamaica, yeah, Jamaica. and uh, now how long were you there working there? I was there 13 years. 13 years. I worked there yeah. for 13 yeah. years. Yeah. Now I know. Marvelous experience. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. What did you find most uh, fulfilling, you know, besides giving talk to the nuns there with <laughs> for confession? <laughs> but, uh, what were some no, of your... <laughs> No, it was just an experience of, of sharing. You know, each year the same people would kind of come back. You'd get kind of the same group, you know. Mm -hmm. And it became, they were really good friends. They became really personal. Uh, I knew their, their lifestyles. I knew a lot about them. And that, that Friday night when everybody was coming in, there was a lot of camaraderie and everything. It was really nice. And I enjoyed preaching. I enjoyed speaking about God. I enjoyed sharing my thoughts. And, and I was apparently effective with it. I did went over well. I seemed to be doing good with it. Uh, so it was a really great experience. Um, I never, I never had uh, any misgivings about, you know, that I made a mistake uh, leaving the department. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, I have to admit that I, it wasn't that I complete, the, co complete quit a job. I had a pension, so I, I got half of it anyway. I got yeah, half of my right, pension. right, okay. But exactly. it was still, it was still a commitment. It was still a commitment yeah. for my family, not just for me, for my family, for my wife and my daughters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <coughs> that's so important. You know, you, you touched on something, uh, John, uh, when you said that the people were coming back, you know, year, year after year. I, I used to be involved with uh, a Felician College in Lodi, New Jersey, and I did a lot of retreats for them with the young people. And there were a lot, we used to go away to a, a place called the Inn of the Spirit. It was a little place in upstate New York, Sullivan County. And um, uh, one of the interesting things about the, many of the students who came, they were nursing students. So they would, uh, but they would come back, like you were saying, you know, every year they'd come back. And the, and in the beginning of the retreat, we always would go around in a circle and everybody introduced themselves and who they were. These are college students and so on. So uh, uh, who would say, well, this is my third retreat, uh, this is my fifth retreat. This, some would say it was my first retreat. So, you know, but a lot of those who were uh, repeat people who were coming back would always, since they were nursing students, they would say, well, I'm back from my booster shot, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's, a good and that's a good thing, yeah, you know, booster. to, uh, again, to encourage the people who are, who are listening. You know, we talked about the power of confession, but how about the power of going on a good retreat? I mean, the important thing is to find, you know, solid retreat houses, and they're not all that solid, so you have to be careful <laughs> that. of that, you know. But, um, you know, finding a solid retreat house and going on a retreat really can just make your faith come alive. And, uh, you know, I, I was involved with a retreat group I, about 30, maybe 40 years in a row. I was doing their retreats, you wow. know? Yeah, I mean, it was a long, long time. And um, uh, the, the many of them would be just keep coming back. They probably knew every joke and every story <laughs> I had to tell, you know? Yeah. But they were very <clears throat> faithful, and it was a closeness. And I saw, I saw many of the men, you know, uh, it was a retreat group for men, and, uh, it, it, you know, growing year after year. There was something happening, and... Uh, but uh, it sustained their, their faith, and these were, you know, really good men, and 
uh, really love the church and very faithful to uh, their their Catholic uh, faith, you know. Uh, so we can in certainly encourage our, our viewers, you know, take advantage of uh, going on retreats and and the like. And um, uh, I, I think there, there's something happens to you. I, I know the first retreat that I ever was in charge of was a group of high school students. I had done retreats where they brought me in, they had a schedule and everything. This is my first retreat I, I have had to put together on my own and I had no experience. And uh, I was making it up as we went along, you know. And uh, you can imagine how confusing that was. Huh? The people I was working with, they were so used to retreats that they had set up, you know, the program, a year, you know, months in advance. And here I am saying, well, in an hour we'll go here and we'll do that. And they came to me halfway through the retreat and they said, Father, this is the, this is the most disorganized <laughs> retreat we've ever been on. He said, but I can't, can't get over what's happening to the kids. I had kids coming up to me and said, we, do we have to go home at the end of this retreat? And all I can think of was Peter on the mountain, remember, when he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's build three tents. They didn't want to go home. You know? so, uh, another one wanted a second mass on the same day. So I said, uh, well, something must be hitting home. John, we're going to have to take a little retreat now. A little retreat. Uh, okay. okay. A little break. A little, a little retreat of mini our retreat. own. A mini <laughs> retreat. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Don't leave us. we got an awful lot more to share with you. back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, and our special guest is a good friend of mine, John Marino. John, uh, I know that your involvement in uh, retreat work continued. The Spirit was, uh, I think, at really at work in your life, wasn't he? Huh? Yes, he you was. Know? And you were led to <laughs> begin uh, a, uh, a, a, a retreat movement called Catholic lay preachers. John, why don't you tell us about that? Because it's very special and you know, very uh, important. Well, and actually, it never came out to be what I originally intended. Uh, when I was on a retreat staff, uh, occasionally I would get inv invitations to, <clears throat> to go to a uh, communion breakfast, Knights of Columbus meeting, and be the guest speaker, you know, at a mm -hmm. breakfast. And it was kind of nice. I would meet people, I would be able to promote the retreats, and it was another opportunity to speak about God. <clears throat> So I got the idea to form a group of lay people, faithful to the magisterium, good speakers, who would be, and offer them to, uh, to, to these groups when they were having their meetings, when they were having their functions. Well, the first one I <clears throat> invited in was my old partner in radio car, Tom Cook. Uh, Tom had a great talk on the passion. He was, he's a mar he was a marvelous, marvelous speaker. So he was excited about it, he joined me. But it was very difficult to get assignments. It never, it never really took off from what I wanted it to be. Most of the time when those people have those meetings, they want a priest, and I can understand that. So it never really became that. Then, interestingly, the Holy Spirit again, with the help of Father Benedict Rochelle, I, I get permission to use the retreat house at Kellenberg High School. And I start running programs there. Tom and I started, <clears throat> started running retreat programs there. And that took off. We had some marvelous, marvelous weekend programs. You took part in a couple yep. of them. Mm -hmm. Father Benedict came to many of them. The first one we had, Marius Koch, did we the Marian retreat with Father Marius Koch. We had a full house. So that Catholic lay preachers, at that function, organizing and running retreats became very successful. And I did that for many years. Uh, each weekend, I would have a theme uh, on what we were going to talk about, the catechism, uh, the teachings of uh, John Paul II. So each speaker would get up and talk a different segment uh, of what the theme was. And, and it worked very well. <clears throat> when I was still at, uh, at the retreat house, I became aware of something. Uh, people come on retreat, they're people of faith. They're people come on a retreat. Sure, most of them sure. are people. Very yeah. mm -hmm. I still found flaws in their theology and what they believed. They still had mistaken, uh, they weren't really in touch with the magisterium and the teachings of the church. 
when you get into things like real presence, when you get into things the sacraments, I would find where they had there were flaws in their in their thinking and what yeah. their understanding of it, better word. So I got an idea and I went to the retreat director and I said, look, the retreat house is closed in, Jan in July. Give me a weekend in July. I want to do a program where it'll be on a retreat format, the same format, but instead of the talks being pastoral, they're going to be educational. So he rolled his eyes. Uh, he, I, I'm sure he didn't think it was going to go anywhere. I packed the house. People are hungry for that kind of stuff. When you mm. offer good adult catechesis, people come. And that's been a focus of mine for a long time, adult catechesis. There are so many people out there who say they're Catholic and mean well, but they really don't know what their faith teaches. And they would be so much more committed. They would love it so much more. They would get so much more out of it if they really knew what the church was teaching, what their faith uh, told them. Mm -hmm. So those weekends that I started doing it in, in the high school uh, would have that kind of a theme. It would be that kind of a program. It would be a treat format, you know, talks, mass, the same way you run a retreat, but all the talks were educational. Mm -hmm. And I had the most successful one I had. I did a, a weekend on the writings of John Paul II. It was a marvelous, we had a great turnout. Father Benedict was there, uh, uh, a number of priests. <clears throat> and that was a really, really fine program, one of the most successful programs I ran. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea being educational rather than pastoral. But now, as luck has it, my partner Tom got a little too old to help me. He can't help me anymore. Yeah, right, right. And I'm all alone. So I can't do the weekends anymore. Uh, I run occasional evenings of recollection. You just yes. did one for me just a couple of weeks ago. That's right. I mm -hmm. run evenings of recollection occasionally. I market uh, uh, my books, and all of the programs that I ran were recorded. Every talk is recorded. I have probably 20, 25 talks a year. <laughs> yeah, so I, record, I know. <laughs> I got to, and Father Benedict, I have a pile of his too. But I, I have them on record, and I, and I offer them for sale. I sell them. Think about the people you love. How many of them are living their faith? How many of them are really mm -hmm. Catholics, if, they're supposed to, if, that they, if they claim to be? How many of them are living their faith? And how many are possibly in serious sin? Mm -hmm. That's your congregation. That's who you preach That's to. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And you preach to them one at a time. Mm -hmm. That's your congregation. Yeah. So that for the police officer, my, congrega my pulpit was the radio car in the station house. And my, my congregation were all those cops I rode with and worked with. Uh, reaching out to them to help them to come back, maybe come back, come on a retreat, mm -hmm. or become a, uh, uh, get involved in the faith uh, in the way they perform their police work. Yeah. One on one, that's the and, and I have my lay preacher's little flyer here, <clears throat> and I have the mission statement to encourage the faithful Catholic laity to accept their role in evangelizing and defending Catholic teaching, to offer materials that inform, inspire, and guide their efforts and to suggest the role of Catholic lay preacher reaching out to one soul at a time. To respond to the need for an engaged, articulate, and well-informed laity as called for by Pope Benedict XVI. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my focus now for Catholic lay preacher. And you had written an article, <coughs> didn't you? That, uh, I wrote that? an article that people can get free. It's, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's free if, if, provided they have internet access. Mm -hmm. I wrote a, an article on how to do this, on, on being a lay preacher reaching out to one person at a time. In mm -hmm. other words, I'm not asking people to get up into a pulpit and talk to a whole bunch of people. Most people right. can't, really can't do no. that. <laughs> they don't want to do it. But this is talking to people you know, people who, who are meaningful to you, people important to you, and preaching your faith to them. Uh, and this little guide that I put together, it's about 10 pages, and you can get it on the internet free just by going to my, web, my uh, uh, website, www. Uh, the lay preacher, the lay preacher dot com. The the uh, um, email uh, site mm -hmm. is lay preach l a y p r e a c h at optimum dot net. That's the easiest way to get the the um, report. By the way, okay. uh, just to go to my uh, uh, send me an email to uh, lay preach at optimum dot net, and I will uh, I can send you the the report. It's free. I send it to you as as a, an email. Good. Now, if people do not have access, um, I, you know, I have to get my, cover my mailing course and everything. Yeah. I can mail them a copy for $5. I have to give $5 to mail. I, yeah. I try and keep mm -hmm. it as cheap as possible. But I can mail it to them for $5. I have mm -hmm. my, my address will show on the, on the, on the, on the in, in, And they can just mail me a check for $5 and I'll mail them a copy of this. 
Okay, <clears throat> very good, very good. You know, uh, you said you said it so well um, when you were talking about how people have to be concerned with their loved ones, people in their own families, and I think every family has someone Absolutely. who has drifted away, need for reverts. Huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Isn't that, uh, John? That's the really I think what Pope Benedict had very much in mind when he uh, kept promoting the new evangelization. Um, you know, get to the people, not, not just to announce the gospel to people who have never heard about Christ, but now especially, remember he points out Western Europe, North America, uh, you know, where so many people have fallen away from the faith, they, they drifted away, um, and need to be called back to that. And as you said, uh, that's their uh, audience. You know, because a lot of them, I think, got, maybe got afraid when they heard, well, I, I, you know, we got to evangelize. Am I going to get a soapbox and stand <laughs> exactly. on this corner exactly. and preach no, like they did that. years ago? Yeah. No, it might be right in your you own house. You can do that if you move to, but, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but this, is, <laughs> this is a lot easier. <laughs> we, we, won't, uh, we won't say no to that, but <laughs> you're right. You never know. Uh, and, and sometimes, the, like uh, your own experience of meeting that man when you were a police officer, you know, it, it could be somebody you meet walking down the street and they, they stop you. And uh, was it uh, uh, was it St. Peter who said, be ready to give an answer for your faith if someone asks you about that? You know, it, could be your neighbor, you know, over the back fence, you're talking one day to them and they ask you, well, what you, we're like this new pope. I've heard people say, uh, uh, so one of our brothers was in a, a, a store where the, the owner was a Jewish man and he, he said to the brother, he said, Is it, he says, what do you think of our, of our pope? Huh? Isn't he great, our pope? Uh, so you never know. These people, I don't know if they're going to become Christians. I don't think that uh, would be necessarily the uh, point that they're at right now, thinking about that. But what an opportunity to share something about the faith. You know, they, they admire the Pope. Well, you know, we thank, we thank God as Catholics. We, you know, uh, we are taught to uh, listen to him. And just as Peter proclaimed Christ, we... we uh, we are, he is our teacher, you know, in a very special way. And Christ said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. See? So people have uh, all kinds of opportunities. I wear the crucifix on the, my outer garment. I wear it even when I go to the gym. Now, I go to the gym three times a week. Um, mm -hmm. even, even at my age, I'm trying to keep it keep whatever trim. shape I can yeah. keep it. But I wear the, the crucifix on the outside. Just a couple of weeks ago, sure enough, a guy sees the cross on me, and he starts a conversation. I'm a baptized Catholic. I went to all the sacraments. He says, now I'm an atheist. I don't believe in anything. So off we went. I had a, I had a contact, and it was just because I was wearing the cross. I uh -huh. don't know if I got anywhere with them, but I can't, can't. Mm -hmm. it was an opportunity to try. You never know. Isn't it true? You know, one of the uh, ideas I used to have about evangelization uh, from years ago was that uh, it's like a, a chain with 10 links in it. You may be putting only the first one or two links. Yeah, Somebody exactly. never thought about exactly. it, you know, like this yeah. person, yeah. I'm an atheist. Yeah. You know? yeah. Somebody else would come along yeah. and put maybe one or two more links on there yeah. because they started to think a little bit about it and then yeah. think a little more about it. And then you get five or six, seven or eight. And somebody will put the last two, nine and 10, and we got them. You know, yeah, back to yeah. the faith. You have to realize that uh, you, you, you're not the only one that God is sending to that person. Yeah. Uh, it's just one of them, <clears throat> one, of, one of the experiences that that person will have. That's right. When Jesus told the apostles, you will reap where others have sown the seed. Huh? In other words, someone else started the process, and sometimes we reap what they had already sown there, and which is a great, great thing because the Holy Spirit, you know, he's the... Uh, he's in control of everything. You know, he controls this whole operation of evangelization. When I remember when uh, we were coming toward the new millennium, uh, Pope uh, John Paul said, you know, that the Holy Spirit was the, he was the uh, prime uh, mover of the new evangelization in the church. I, I liken him to a conductor of a great orchestra. 
And every one of us is in that orchestra, even if you're playing a little flute or second fiddle or whatever you're playing. Everybody has a role in there. And the Holy Spirit said, now, you, you, and you, you, you know. So we all have to be ready to do our part. And we just never know when the Holy Spirit is going to, uh, uh, you know, call upon us to, to witness. It could be a silent witness. You know, there's that quote uh, that's been going around about St. Francis. I hadn't heard it for many years. I had not heard it in my younger days as a Franciscan, but uh, the quote was, you know, preach and if necessary, use words. So sometimes it's just our good example. You know, the, uh, again, I, I think back to your incident, John, uh, after your retreat and as a police officer, and you said to that man, Jesus Christ gave you that sandwich today. You never know how many times that man might have thought back to that. Hmm? I, yeah, I would hope so. Mm -hmm. At the time, I, I was surprised by it. Because it came out of, I don't know where it came from, you know, and I'm thinking, like, couldn't I have thought of something better to say? Is that the best thing I could have said? But as it, later on, as I wait, waited and thought about it more, I realized it was a very important thing to say. Mm -hmm. And maybe something that touched him and maybe he stayed with him a little bit. I often wonder what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. If I saw him again, I wouldn't recognize him. Right, yeah. But it was yeah. an experience that told me a number of things about myself, that my faith may be a different kind of police officer. Uh, and that's important. Um, police work can be very faith destructive. Sure. You, you are involved in so much. You're involved. You know, nobody calls a cop to say, hey, I'm having a good day. Everything's great, I'm having a good day. Mm -hmm. You only get called to turmoil, to accidents, people suffering pain, and you're dealing with it day in and day out. And that can be kind of destructive. Uh, you can start to feel, uh, where is God in all of this? Mm -hmm. um, and by having the faith, uh, it makes your police experience better. It mm -hmm. makes your experiences better. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? You have to have hope. You have uh, to have hope yeah. even to try to, yeah. it could be the worst criminal, but, you know, Jesus on that cross, <coughs> you know, Father, forgive them. And uh, he's the good shepherd looking for his lost sheep. And, you know, one, one of them was on his right hand there on Calvary, you know, on another cross. And he said, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And you, again, we just never know how our role in this whole work of evangelization is going to touch um, someone's heart with a word they needed to hear, you know. Today, you don't hear a whole lot of messages in the world that lifts up. You know, there's so much emphasis on a, a cult the culture of death, as, as Pope John Paul called it, you know. Everybody's talking about the women's rights for an abortion. What about a woman's right to have a baby? That's her, that's her dignity that God gave her you know, to bring a child into this world. You know, we never hear women being told that, you know, as if you got to destroy that life because that's going to mess up your career. How many, how many people grow lonely in their older age because they have no more, there's no people around them, no children? You know, I was uh, talking to a family that told me they had an exchange student from China in their home for a little period of time, for months and so on. And uh, you know what this little boy who was in their home was most fascinated by in their house? It was a picture of the family gathering because they don't have any brothers and sisters over there because of their abortion, you know, their, their one yeah, child. Right. Yeah. They, they don't have any cousins, Yeah, yeah. you, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. one cousin, <coughs> you know. But to see all these beautiful brothers and sisters, cousins and aunts and uncles and everything else was just the little kids stared at that picture continuously, they said. Yeah. You know, uh, it just was so amazing. Because, you know, we know that the greatest joys we have are in, in dealing with one another, dealing with people. No, material things, you know, they can satisfy you for a little while, but they can't really make you happy. They can't get inside into your heart uh, to, to bring you joy. You know, one of the feelings I get when I hear all, you know, uh, uh, people who are against abortion and, and working against, they keep uh, talking about the death of a, of a human being, which is certainly uh, an important factor. But what something that's left out, and I don't hear too often, is the soul of the mother. Yeah. We're losing a child, that's a, that's a, that's a tragedy, that's a tragedy, where all the potential of that child is lost. But I never hear, I, I don't hear that, I shouldn't say never. I rarely hear it be, being proposed as, the soul of the mother is at danger. Yes. It's a mortal sin. 
Sure. Uh, and and it, I don't think the, the these women are thinking, and even even the fathers who agree with it, the ones who are performing it, uh, you're committing a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. um, their salvation and, is at And their salvation. You're, you're talking mm -hmm. about eternity. You're talking about. Yeah. You're talking about uh, what mm -hmm. Jesus told us about uh, the, the narrow door. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, and so I, many, I would like to see it proposed that way more, a little bit more often. Yeah, and so many of them carry this burden of guilt and shame for years and years. And even the men now, John, a lot of them are beginning to realize. I, I heard of a men's uh, retreat that uh, uh, some of our friars were participating in, and the speaker, he's, he, he gave a talk, and he had brought his girlfriend to get an abortion, and he said, as I was paying that money, for that abortion, he said, I realized I was paying for the death of my own child. And you know, they told me he could not stop crying during that whole talk. You know, that's how profoundly it hit him. You're right, John, we have to be concerned about the, the mothers and the fathers too now, you know, beginning to realize what have I done and uh, call them forth to God's mercy. Because that's what ultimately it's all about. John, we're going to have to, we're coming to the end of our program. It's been wonderful. And I, and I just hope uh, people will, you know, heed the message of good confession, <laughs> go to retreat, you know, and be that's good it, evangelists, right? Uh, John, I'm going to lead a little prayer, okay? And uh, give a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mercy you have shown us sending us Christ your Son, who died on the cross to take away our sins, and who ministers his mercy to us through his church and the sacraments. We thank you for the graces of conversion in so many lives. And now I bless you, my brothers and sisters, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God love you. Well, we come to that part in our program now, John. This is where we make our little appeal. You know, uh, you've heard a wonderful testimony here tonight. John Marino, my good friend, um, you know, his conversion of his life. And we've got so many people who have to hear this story. We've got so many people who need to experience this, a similar conversion. Hmm? And uh, how are they going to do it? Hmm? You know, Scripture says, how will they get the gospel unless somebody preaches it to them? Well, we can't always be everywhere in the world, but uh, TV can be everywhere in the world, <laughs> at least a lot of places. As long as they turn it on, and one great station that has certainly proclaiming the gospel everywhere is EWTN. So if you felt this program has helped you, it'll help many others as well. So will all these programs. So please support EWTN as generously as you can, and God will reward you. I bless you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God love you.